Hey, welcome to the Do Good Work Podcast. Today, we're talking to Daria Goodnick. Daria is the co-founder and CEO of Bunch, an AI coach and community that makes it easy for aspiring leaders to get 1% better every single day. Daria is helping future leaders grow. She's a bookworm psychologist and a relentless optimist. And she is on a mission to help everyone make their own dent in the universe. Dario, welcome to the pod. It's so great to be here. Thank you for having me. I know we scrambled this together, made it happen, but we're here. I love it. One of the things that I've noticed, and even in entrepreneurship or even in our own skill sets, and for our audience listening to, you have this, and I can guarantee that you have this. What bold guarantee can I, can I have for you? <laughs> the bold guarantee is that you underestimate your experiences, you underestimate your skill sets. For us, for example, let's say you know how to ride a bike. Let's say you know how to stand up paddleboard. Let's say you know how to throw a baseball or a football perfectly. You've practiced, but you take it for granted and other people like don't, can't do that. And for you, it's, oh, it's just another Tuesday. It's just another bike ride. I think we, we can say that in the practical sense, but in reality, Daria, how have you experienced this in your own life being a tech founder, female founder, and then also working, I'm pretty sure you worked in the VC world. Like, Tell us a little bit more about your story and some of the things that you weren't paying attention to that you started paying attention to as you became more aware that, hey, this is valuable or this is different. Yeah, I think it's a really great way to, to start off the conversation because I think in many ways, my story is really a I don't belong here story. So I think mm. the, the kind of that goes hand in hand with taking certain things for granted because you're over focusing on the things that you cannot do. So I was, I was born in Soviet Union and I moved to Germany in the 90s and I grew up majorly socialized, majorly in Germany, but of course worked some in different places after. So overall I have like pretty open perspective, but I keep thinking this feeling of I was lucky to get here. So mm -hmm. that means that I don't know what, like, I don't have what's required yet. I need to focus on all these things that I cannot do. And there's probably 15 things and more in each and every situation. So in that moment, I oftentimes pretty much forget that I'm doing a lot already and I'm actually succeeding in like many ways. And luckily, I think I'm surrounded by people that often enough remind me of that and not in a ego build up way. But I think when we think about it, I'm a founder of a startup and startup journeys are really challenging and exciting mm -hmm. at the same time. Oftentimes, I think it's really difficult to see like, are you succeeding? What does success even mean? Which milestones and yeah. KPIs are we already achieving? How is that enough? What is going on? And I think oftentimes it's so helpful to hear someone that we work with, customer, a user, an investor, someone random that <clears throat> comes along and it's like, you already changed the lives of all these people. Look mm. at what you and the team already have achieved. You already succeeded on so many levels. So it doesn't actually even matter whether you can reach that next milestone or not. You'll figure it out, but look at how far you've come. And I think this reminder is really important because as a psychologist, for instance, it comes quite naturally to me to be able to ask good questions, to build a good relationship. Culture has always been not in a way that, oh, I have to care about culture that a lot of, I think, business owners feel yeah. this pressure of like, there is this one other thing now. We also have to have great clip. It's hard <laughs> enough already to stay off my back. But I think my company was founded on the premise of seeing that most founders and managers want to do good by their people, but they don't have the skills and and the capacities to do so, it seems overwhelming. And as a psychologist, it came naturally to me to see all of those things. So I think that oftentimes when I get feedback from my team or other customers, I get that feedback of, oh, it's really great to talk to you. It's like having a coach on my <laughs> team and being yeah. able to go to her and ask her questions. You always help out and everything. And I take that for granted 100,000%. Like I always yeah. focus on the things of, yes, but we don't yet have the $100 million business and I need to figure out the business model and here there's <laughs> oh God, gaps yes. and that I don't know. Yeah. But yeah. No, well, look, I want to highlight two things you mentioned. And I think this is important too, because even for my own self-reflection, and again, not in the egotistical way, but also to count your blessings, to look at what you've already done is to say, wait a minute. I am successful. Say that right. If you're listening to this right now, wow, I am successful. There's a lot that you can be grateful for. Obviously, we can count down even to the fact that we can breathe. But it's also the fact that maybe, okay, maybe you didn't get that promotion. Maybe you didn't get that next round of VC funding. Maybe you didn't get that valuation yet. But what did you achieve so far? And I find that even in my own thinking of instead of always being in want, 
making sure that you're in appreciation because our brain does mesh. We do have a lens that we put on glasses depending on how we think. And if we're always in want, what was the story of, even if you have like, if when you make seven figures or you have this number of revenue, whatever, and you think, oh, I still feel poor, then you will always continue regardless of that. So even in the progress yeah, that, that yeah. you make. One thing also that you mentioned, because I've, I've had the opportunity to mentor, to coach, to work with multiple teams remote and help develop others. And I think that's one of the greatest pleasures that I've had in the opportunity to lead others. But it's also a huge responsibility. And I did find specifically to helping them grow is that capacity, is their capacity for growth. I'm curious to know, like, how did you, how are you tackling that issue? Because it's not, it's one thing to have skill set and education, yeah. but then it's also, how do you get that person to actually grow and expand in that capacity specifically? In, in, in and are you referring part? to like their potential in general to be able to build up the skill? Or are you also referring to the motivation to want to change? The motivation, not so much, because there is that's a whole podcast we can probably focus on. But yeah. it, I think yeah. the potential to change and the skill sets to change, because I think obviously the mm. person has to want it. You can never inspire someone yeah. externally, but yeah. the actual in the doing and expanding that capability. So I can, I think, only answer that in context. Mm -hmm. I think I would say because in my context is currently as a founder building a team around a certain bunch of people, right? Mm -hmm. And in that sense, I think I have definitely experienced that in the past where I see potential in a person, they see potential in a person, and we try to develop in a specific direction, but then we run against the wall and we're like, no matter how, which direction we're trying, like this doesn't really get better. Mm -hmm. um, but the person wants to improve actually. So there is no like real pushback in that sense, but it's more like really a capacity question. And I think it comes down to two things in that context. I think it can be applied to other contexts too, because you never work in isolation. You never have the, only this person in isolation. So one is who do you build around them? Who else do you bring on board? How do you collaborate with other partners, clients, et cetera? What is the context you can build around them? Because growing sometimes can mean building up skills. Hard yeah. skills, people skills, other skills. But oftentimes growing also just can mean adapting better to what cannot be changed and building a yeah. bigger awareness of where you are limited and opening up your opening up the awareness of that person to this is where I need to help. This is where I need bridges. I need to bridge myself out. I can't expand the house. I can't expand this like building I have, but mm -hmm. I need to build bridges to others because in case I want to deliver this and this value, this and this result, I still mm -hmm. need to have this other part. I just can't <laughs> deliver it myself. Yeah. And I think this ability to pull in other perspectives or also like almost tucking into someone else's resource capacity, skills, whatever you want to call it, is really crucial and important. And that can always be done. And oftentimes I think people don't see it. They don't feel empowered enough to reach out. They don't even have the fantasy to imagine if I am working as a small business and I try to do this like marketing thing much better and I just can't succeed enough, like I know it's still not good enough. I tried, I did the courses and whatever, like I'm still in there. They, I think oftentimes just need someone, a coach, a peer, someone that helps them to reframe the situation from a perspective of who can do it and how can you deliver value to that person so that mm. you have that thing to offer. So just because you cannot deliver it, I find it like, not necessarily limitation of growth, because if you manage to figure out how you can deliver it and how you can partner with the right people around you, isn't that growth too? A hundred percent. No, that was actually, so I'm going to share a reflection as you mentioned this, because I'm taking this in my own notes. And this is like an open reflection here. And it's so simple, but I didn't think about it the way that you just mentioned it. Usually when I think about growth or helping one person, I always think into the one-to-one -one context like me to have this person and focus specifically on them. And there's an opportunity there. But what you also mentioned is focus on what's around them too. How can you empower the environment, the other people around them, the situations or the context in which they're in to facilitate their growth? Make, it's, not, it's not an easy job. Nothing's really ever easy. But it does create, I would say, more fluidity for their growth, really, because you're focusing on two dynamics, the personal, the one-to-one, -one, but then also their circle, their environment, which you can support or control. That's 100%. That's pretty... And maybe, I don't know if any of you out there are football slash soccer and uh, may have noticed there is this a new world champion, Argentina and so on. And it's interesting because I think in this case, it was from the analysis perspective, 
in many ways a coach win, I think people attribute mm. like the actual win to the coach more than to Messi, who is like a superstar in his particular individual football skills. And it's like the, I think, one of the top players in the world and all times and whatever. But he's been like that forever. He's been great forever. He played for many different teams and they never actually managed to complete the world championship and they never managed to win. And when you watch the play, it always felt he really wants it really hard, but the team is not really working together that well. And like, it's not mm -hmm. balanced enough and it's not going to work and it didn't work. And I think what was different this time around, if you see, it's not the skill of that individual. And as a coach, I think, or even as a player on a team like that, if you are playing with someone that is like really great at what they do, you have two options. You either go into like competition mode or cooperative or collaboration mode. Mm. And I think in many ways in the past run, there were more people competing with him on the team, which is impossible because he's just like out of this world better and it's just a different class and you can just never fucking succeed in that. So what was different <laughs> this time, I think they had a much more humble coach. Like when you hear him speak, it's all humility all around. And I think he was able to humble down everyone on the team enough to say nobody's better than the other. We're all working together or we are not working together. We won't succeed. And you with your superstar skills still need to serve the team and you all the others. Like you don't need to prepare yourself with him. You need to see yourself as someone who adds on. So you have a role yeah. to play here and your role can be to pass this ball from here to here. Like it doesn't really matter what role it is, but we need all the roles. And I think Thinking about it this way is more helpful because otherwise you get stuck in these. And I can relate to this as a CEO and founder of the CVAC business. There is also this thought of, oh, did I raise enough money? Why do I not get more money? And like this and that. And they already have many more LinkedIn followers and all of this like yeah. competitive pressure. But I don't think it really helps. I think the moment you open yourself up to, I could learn from them and maybe and maybe not their skills are relevant for me. Maybe I have a different path to success, but... Mm -hmm. It's true that I need to build my bridge. Like I can't ignore their success and the skills they have built. Exactly. So I need to actively reach out and see what can I offer to them? How can I learn from them? And then move on to the next milestone. No, oh, hundred percent. And let's actually dive into that because let's talk about what you're building. Let's talk about where AI plays a role into this because of what you just mentioned earlier, like I love the case study about Argentina, the coach from that perspective, I haven't heard that because the story is you know, Messi being the greatest of all time. There has, there are greats. He is, he's phenomenal, but it's also like the team aspect and the coach aspect, but that is very personal. It's very one-to-one -one almost feel like there has to be a human element. How are you bringing that element to uh, an AI coaching community? How does that work? Why start that? Tell me a little bit more about what you're building. Yeah, definitely. It's pretty easy, actually. I was a coach myself. So as I mentioned, I, you know, the story is pretty, in my head, it's really straightforward okay. because I was a psychologist and I studied like business or psychology, let's say, and I focused on empowering teams and individuals at work from the very beginning. And I, there's a different story of how I came to do that because that wasn't what I planned to do, but I ended up doing that. And eventually I ended up being a coach because I did my first startup. I built my first team. I succeeded a bunch and I failed a bunch. And then I came back into the ecosystem as someone who was looking for the next step and kind of not really yet knowing what I'm going to do. And I noticed that I have these two brains or two halves that typically mm -hmm. don't go together. One is this people-friendly psychology empathy person that like really wants to understand team dynamics and like individuals. And the other one is an entrepreneur that wants to drive results and make change in the world and see impact and just also to a degree compete yeah. with others and so on, like performance mindset. And I had both. And so I was like, ooh, most founders don't have the other thing, the like yeah. soft thing or whatever you want to call it. And I need to bring it to them because they're missing so many opportunities. They fail because of team dynamics very often because they don't 100%. tap into the potential and so on. So I jumped into that. I started working with a lot of founding teams around me with investors and so on. And I started consulting and coaching as a practice, basically. So my next second chapter in my entrepreneurial life was a consultancy with a bunch of freelancers. We started growing and we were serving customers and some of them became unicorn companies after and they were super tiny when we started working with them. But anyways, I felt no matter how much I sell my time, I will never reach everyone that needs um, support. And I don't see the current existing systems working really well because when you see into platforms and things like that, they are really limited and inaccessible. Like you have to be lucky enough to work in a company that has a contract with better app approach app and maybe or not you qualify for that program and like all this And the program stuff. has to be good. Sometimes they suck. And then 
<laughs> even if you get it, it doesn't even like work or whatever. So I was thinking about this and thinking this needs to be done more scalable. And I also heard from my customers at that point in time that they did actually even prefer like the workshop stuff always. Like sometimes it was cool and sometimes they were looking for something more continuous, something more tech enabled, something more in their pocket, kind of like it reminds me, it not just me, it does something, it gives me feedback. Like it doesn't have to be you with your physical time always. I appreciate you, but I would even always love like something lights, lighter, bite size in between the actual intense sessions that I have with the human code. Mm -hmm. And that resonated a lot with me because I think we, at that point in time, already had a lot of convenience enablement through tech. Like when you think about Uber or Netflix and other brands and platforms that enable us to give access to something very quickly in like as much as we needed at the time, like on demand when we need it. And for mm -hmm. this personal professional growth space that just simply wasn't available. And yeah, I think we started building Bunch exactly because of that, because we felt if we truly want to give access to growth opportunities to every professional out there, which we do, my co-founder and I are both very aligned on that mission then we have to look into tech enablement. And the way we see it is not that we will be replacing the human interaction. Okay. We are enabling it. So we supplementing it. We oftentimes are the first step of someone's journey. So like many of our users either could not afford a coach yet, or also were kind of, you know, like playing with the thought, but not quite sure. And it sounded scary and expensive and not for them. And yeah, inaccessible. And so when they actually start using Bumble, yeah, I can do this. It's like a few minutes a day. Super actionable, cool stuff. I can share it with my friends sometimes. I can apply it in my work. I get good feedback after I do it. I keep doing this thing because that kind of like really works. And I think as they go further in the journey and as the goals become clearer, what they want to develop with seven into, like where do they have mm. gaps? I think the call for a coach and a more deeper conversation becomes louder and louder. And so what we're doing with Bunch right now, especially in Bunch Premium, is to supplement the like, content tech enabled async pathway or learning journey that you'll have with a few interactions with experts on specific topics that you are working Interesting. on. So like more using tech to give you access to all these different experts on these different topics that you will need over the course of your lifetime. And we have it all in one on the palm of your hand. That's really cool. Are you doing like a marketplace to in the back to have coaches hop on and support? Is that, isn't it's that like- It's really interesting. Like because we're trying to figure this out and we are like not 100% quite sure yet because we're testing three models against each other. And one of them is a marketplace oh, wow. model, like a demand gen for our coaches type of model where we pre-qualify the requests for content and basic interaction or sync chat interaction and then forward the specific cases. Another model is pretty much like a full tech enabled model where you don't actually need to interact so much. You have this from a code perspective, you don't result in, oh, I booked a session, but more like I have a backlog of requests or things I need to give feedback on. And then I like work that down and mm -hmm. that pays me, but it's not necessarily the like classical yeah. coach marketplace that you would think about that exists already where you actually get paid for sync time. And I think this like sync async nature, there is something there still that we haven't resolved because mm -hmm. I deeply believe if we would make the knowledge of experts more accessible in AC moments, yeah. we would have so much more impact all around. There's still this like limitation around, I think, like capturing their information into a distillable. Okay, that's interesting. So it's more about these like feeding the machine with the right information. Yes. I think it's more of a platform than it is a marketplace, if I'm really honest. But we do have one stakeholder group, so to say, or like one partner group that is very crucial and key that we couldn't succeed without. And that's the human experts that we are distilling the knowledge from and making it like bite-sized and modular so that the machine can then distribute it to the learner. Oh, wow. So then your expertise is essential, like the key value behind the scenes is distilling those nuggets in a way that feeds yeah. into it's your machine learning. And then from there feeds it yeah. correctly with the algorithm to the user yeah. when they need it, as they need it. That's Correct. fascinating. Yes. And I think the other difference is that when you think about coaching marketplaces, they oftentimes are very phased, like they come with a phase of your life. Like you work for this company, that company has the service, you do this for a few weeks, that's really cool. And very similar to a, let's say, trajectory of your health, it's really difficult to keep information over long periods of time. But in reality, your growth and your personal development happen over long periods of time from like yeah. when you start out to where you are in the mid career to like later stages of your career. Yeah. If you could actually keep that information and use technology to work for you, to point out gaps, to predict 
specific steps and call out opportunities that you are not seeing, then it's a whole different game for every individual in the world when it comes to their development of their potential to realization of the dreams and goals that they have. And I think this is the power in the end that a platform like Bunch can have is when you actually look at it from like years of lifetime of a user perspective. So it's not only the distributing of content at the right point in time, but it's also like creating this wallet of learning and development for yeah, you. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool to have that. Um, what year is it? It's 20, I'm like 11 years or whatever in the journey. That'd be pretty cool to have that library. Right. I'm curious, are you, are, on the back, do you also, do people opt in to want to have a sync, like a synchronous meeting with coaches? Is that something that you're potentially yeah, adding so as an add-on? Yeah, we're testing that currently. And the reason I said we are not quite sure yet is because there is like opposing competing concepts basically at play and there is not like one clear picture. And I think it depends on where you are in the journey. So we are also digging a little bit into like user segmentation and things like that. But people definitely want sync sessions in particular situations. They just don't want it to be the only default mode. And they also don't necessarily see it as necessary to resolve particular problems. And so I think incredible, it kind of like incredible, a isn't it? Wow. Yeah. We're, three years from now, five years from now, where do you see like the actual, once we have AI, like truly doing some thinking and providing insights like this, where do you see the need of coaches or how do you, how does that, how's that going to work with AI leadership? How mm, interesting. I think what the tech does really well, and I think with GPT chat, we see it like how well it is actually working and how far we've come on that development is to find the right piece of information at the right time. Like mm -hmm. that is a job that I think was to be all, to be honest, overdue. Like, why do I need to go to Google and then Google stuff? manually and then still sift through like pages and pages of marketing material until I get to one fucking resource. One actually, nugget. It, it's incredible. So like this distillation of Google searching and results physically and summarizing it into a human consumable format. I think that was overdue and I'm really glad that GPT got there very quickly and OpenAI team has done great work and all of that that enables all of us to move forward faster. Mm -hmm. But I think what can be done is when you when we talk to our users like our perspectives as consumers don't change so quickly. We can trust the machine to find the right piece of information more than we trust the human, but we don't necessarily trust the machine to make calls on setting the goals, if that makes sense. Like, yeah. how do you decide where you want to develop yourself into? Like, even if you just ask that to GPT chat, like, of course, it can give you perspectives of like, similar people with similar profiles do this and that, but like, it's still requiring a certain trust building exercise, I think, and like an empathy building exercise between yeah. the agent that is coaching you in that moment and mm -hmm. you to really buy into that future vision. And I think that is where I see lots of the um, value add of humans is basically like to really see this context that we were discussing earlier. Dreamers, um, yeah. Which I think is very difficult to put into any search, no matter how smart it is. Like it just won't your know your life and your priorities entirely in the end. And like the advice you get to set that target is really, really, I, I don't see that being like technically enabled, at least not in the next two to three years, maybe later. Yeah. I mean, there would be, that's a, we have two separate pods to do one about the other topic and one about here is like AI and consciousness. I feel like it'd be very difficult yeah. with it being a visionary. Tell me about how it is running. You're, you're driven. You have both the two skill sets that are rare driven performance based, but then you also understand people and actually like to learn about people, what makes them tick. And that probably helps you become a better leader and lead better teams. How is it though? Tech is usually male dominant. VC, I think those statistics were pitifully low, like the number of VC dollars that female founders actually Our acquire like, yeah, and yeah. get. Like, how is it working in that environment? What have you learned? What are some of the insights and what are like some key things that you would recommend for other female founders listening? Yeah, I think one part that I mentioned in our pre-conversation as well is that we, I think in a perf if you're a performance-driven human, that oftentimes comes with the baggage of not seeing systemic problems, like not seeing sexism as a problem, not seeing racism as a problem as clearly and so on, because you're really focused on, I don't want to be the victim. I want to move forward. I want to own my own journey. Like, 100%. I don't fucking care about systemic problems. I will make my way. <laughs> and then on the one hand, that's really great. And it helps you to succeed in life. Like I, I do drive and I think a lot of people do again, a lot of like inspiration and energy from that drive. It helps me go places. 
it's similar to like bias to action. If your bias to action is like blindly targeted at random shit and you have no capacity to understand the problem space, mm -hmm. you will always fall short in your potential because you can't create a solid strategy that enables you to drive action into a specific direction for long enough to achieve something really remarkable because you can't like just scramble around yeah. and be very action oriented. <laughs> so that <laughs> makes sense. So that's the same with performance. It's like you need to think about the problems that are around you and that mm -hmm. are part of your context and your system. And that I think when I started to open myself up to that, like view on the world, I started noticing things and I didn't want to solve them right away, but I wanted to at least be open to seeing them. And mm. I think it started to become clear to me that sexism is a real, like proper, like real issue, not only something that people say on TV or write in magazines you or whatever. You experienced like, it for real. Yeah. It's like a real thing that not only me, but many people go through and that impacts us negatively as like a community that doesn't have so much like positive outcomes. I think yeah. this was just a few years ago, maybe yeah. five years ago or so, like at the beginning of the bunch journey. And I think the examples that come to mind, like I think actually in my first startup, when I went, moved to Argentina to build it out because it was a travel related startup. And so it made sense that we were serving like non-Spanish speaking travelers that come into South America and so on. And mm -hmm. I think in a fundraising conversation with that startup, I was asked whether I moved there because I had an Argentine boyfriend or I fell in love with a Latin lover or something like that. And it was like a serious investor. Like we considered taking money from him and like it was a very credible person in the community. And I was mm. baffled in that moment because I'm like, like, how is this appropriate that you ask me this? But also why does that even matter? We're talking about the potential of my business here and not like my private life. I think it's like our small things that I think every woman experiences like five times a day at this point. But the other thing that was like more crucial and really made me like wake up was when I started fundraising with Bunch and like our priest around, I think I ended up being in San Francisco for some reason. And I was invited to this event on Sand Hill Road was super scary. As I mentioned, I yeah. constantly live with this feeling I don't belong. So me being on Sand Hill Road with my trucks and my t-shirt was like the culmination of I do not belong here. Yeah. I could not be more wrong. <laughs> what if I went there because I had this friend that is building some other SaaS thing and whatever, and he had a ticket. I'm like, yes, of course, like opportunity. So we went there and it was really interesting, like lots of really rich people. And it was a bit funny because most of the rich people had like suits and were male and most of the female people in that like event wearing really pretty dresses and did not yeah. have a tag, but <laughs> were like the plus one of the powerful person in the room. And that was like, like weird in it on itself. If yeah. you can't relate to like the, there is no female peers in that group and you're lying and like, where are you other women? <laughs> um, in the oh my gosh. But I think that wasn't even the thing. There was a situation where when I registered for the ticket, I put in my name and so on my company. And then I showed up at the desk and then there was this person from the hotel and asked, and he asked me like, are you here with someone? And like, I'm like registered for this event thing, that the YC event that is going on. And he was like, yeah, can you show me your uh, business card? And I'm like, what? You mean my ID? And if you feel you've shown your ID, like your, do you have a business card of your business? I'm like, oh my gosh, who okay. carries those? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this was like a while ago. It's like 2018 or something. But um, uh, still, who carries those? I was those? kind of like, are you trying to what? Oh my gosh, that's messed up. <laughs> do you want to know my email address? What is going on? And he was like, no, wait here. And then I was like, kept waiting. And he then went to a chat with someone, came back. Everything was super awkward. And eventually let me pass, but I had to actually showcase some proof that the company is real. So it was more oh about, my gosh. do you have some letterheads or something that helps me understand that you are really the founder of City Buddies? And I went in and I was like a little bit confused about the situation. I didn't really understand what was, what just happened. And I asked people around me, was raising it back. I'm like, I'm, I don't know. It was weird. Nothing really bad happened. <laughs> I was confused. And then one person told me, oh my God, I understand now. So the problem they have is that this, this new playbook of basically professional sex workers in this area is to pretend to be a female founder oh, wow. and they don't wear like dresses and stuff anymore. They wear like very normal startup clothes and they basically smuggle themselves into the events and whatever. And I had potentially, he mistook you or wanted to make sure that you were actually a proper guest of this like event and so on. And I think I, this was wrong on so many levels because I am fully respectful of professional sex workers. I wouldn't like, I don't feel offended by the fact that like somebody would think that, but at the same time, I think just this like 
expectation that you have to fill a certain mold. And when I come around the corner, like my mold is much more probable to be a sex worker than it mm. is to be an actual founder and business owner of a tech business, made me think a lot and be like question and definitely fed my like, you don't belong here. Motive. And it's interesting how it like influences your psychology. That's what I was about to get right to, because then you start thinking that and then believing and then perception. Of course, I mean, there obviously was no it's messed conversation. Up. There was no deal closed in that meeting, in that event. No like confident Daria showed up in that event anymore, was able to pitch her business. Like I was all busy with, do I need to change how I look? Do I need to change my clothes? Oh my God. Like I'm so confused. And I think yeah. we really underestimate these Micro cuts, I think some DNI coach called it like the death by a thousand micro cuts. It's like oh, weird yeah. misplacements and like mini moments that suggest to women in the workplace that they are everything else, but not a successful business leader. Yeah. That's, so is it an age thing, do you think? Or is it, do you see it also in our... I don't really know. Like I've still, I'm still stumbling. Like the last time I experienced sexism mm. was two days ago. And like the way I deal with it is not anymore closing my eyes and also not being super like frantic about it it's just a normal part of life mm. but i think it's very important you asked about advice and kind of what to do i think the two things i learned that helped me deal with it is don't close your eyes call it out to yourself at the very least maybe to colleagues or allies you have around you and help your mind understand that no, it, you still belong here. This is your job. It's okay to be here. People yeah. just have different biases and they fall yeah. into these biases. It's not your problem. It's theirs in that moment. I think it's very important to call it out because I think if you don't admit to yourself that this just happened, which is a very naturally female reaction in this moment, I think it's just like nothing happened. It just becomes a normal part of your self-perception. And at the same time, there is a subconscious like movement happening in your head and it remembers of okay so if we accepted this part of our identity then that's who we are oh and yeah so then you can't lie to yourself and then you start can't believing lie to exactly. that's an issue how exactly. did you and the second part you're... is yeah build a supportive network around you and be very careful about allies like and build your own allies as well so hmm. very often it's quite tricky i think with these situations we all have different perspectives on it but i think it's very important that you feel at least safe with people around you to have these conversations. They don't have to agree with it, with you. And they also don't have to feel the same way. So oftentimes when I report situations and I've worked through them, I also get challenged. And then male colleagues or friends are just like, I'm not sure I'm seeing it. Maybe it would have happened to me too. Let's think about it. And I think these perspective exchanges are very crucial and important. So as long as you have space to work through these experiences, no matter the outcome, you will be fine and you will come out stronger. I think these are the two things that I learned work really well. Just, no, I love that. There's one key question too, because you mentioned this and I in no in zero way to compare, but just to give a different perspective of my experience growing up, minority first generation here in the United States. And there is there is I had to work through some things, obviously being a little bit just my minority Mexican and how like the treatment and like, there is I've experienced it. Family has for sure a ton, but how do you, because you're driven, because you're intelligent, because you're a go-getter, how do you balance the fact of not playing the victim, but also accepting or like understanding what, ex what just happened and still not getting to the victim mindset? This is a really great question. I don't know whether I figured it fully out yet. I'm trying to balance it. Like, I think I want to change things around me. So I think the victim mindset keeps, kicks in if you just complain about stuff and you stop there and you expect someone yeah. else to drive the change. So I think there is active steps that I push myself to do, even though it always feels, oh my God, I'm so busy and there's no time or whatever. Like I learned to prioritize things that are just important to me and depending on my milestones and my startup. And I think supporting female founders, for instance, is a very important priority and I have made time for it like three years in a row now. I'm coaching and mentoring and have a few female founders on the pros to make sure I respond and I make time wow. for calls and things like that. So I think that gives me the feeling of I perceive a problem and the difference between Daria the victim and Daria the aware change maker is that I think about the problem, I talk about the problem, and I do steps towards solving the problem that are in my control mm -hmm. versus stopping at the problem. And I think the other part, like as a go-getter, as I mentioned, like it's probable that you will feel uh, fall into the other trap. It's like, I just don't want to see that problem because I can't do anything about it right now. Yeah, It's too big. 
So I'm just not going to pay attention. And I think that's also bad because it just manifests issues that we actually can't have. For neglect. Yeah, I definitely opt into that camp of let me not focus on the drama and the BS. Let me just vote. But you're, you call it out 100%. But for everything going on at Bunch and switching gears here to see what's exciting of what you're working on in 23 and uh, what, are, like, what are your future goals? Yeah, we're currently at a community of users of 70,000 professionals around the world. And we nice. just actually are releasing our preview premium release. So we were a free app before. We now built the premium tier and we are launching that. So it's really cool to actually have first paying clients. Woohoo. As a business owner and entrepreneur, always very special moment. <laughs> uh, congratulations. That's awesome. Thank you so much. And it's also superbly weird to me that it took so long. Like when you build these. I don't know, community-driven, gamified, very consumery types of platforms. It can take months or sometimes years to get to a point where it actually makes sense to yeah. introduce monetization. And it was the first time for me that it actually took us like one and a half years to get here. And this time of not having revenue was in completely nerve-wracking. So oh I'm God. really glad we got here. <laughs> to this point, I also understand why we had the strategy and of course, like help devise it and we work with the board on this, but... There is the trade-off of not having revenue as like a North Star as well. It's a little bit funky. But to back to your question, so 2023 is all about actually helping to grow the paying user base as well and like deliver more value to our premium users, deepen that relationship with Bunch, really making learning and growing with Bunch and even more real thing than it is today. So moving like from the convenient user experience, public success and mm -hmm. creating public milestones for our users that they can use for job search, they can use for promotions oh, wow, and really cool. make it very tangible that you are actually changing as a person and you are becoming a better person for that. That's one thing. And the other thing is nice. as well on like the business side of things, we also have a funding round coming up and we are preparing for our series A next year. And it's also really exciting and like, the current downturn and the current market, definitely an interesting, different experience to go oh, through. Dude, we had to talk to you. You had to talk to you back on the pod when you raised those funds. That's a, that journey is exciting, but also sounds like a really complicated chess match. It really is. It's like more strategic than ever, I think. Yeah. It really feels like you're playing chess now. And it's interesting because both of my co-founder and I have ordered like strategy books for this <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's not by chance. It definitely, I'm going to read the Play to Win book. I don't remember the author, but it's- Play to Win. Uh, okay. We'll write that down. Play to Win. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love it. Oh, this is exciting. And that's so cool that you're able to create tangible like identity shifts for the users because if they can see that, their identity changes and they can attribute it to the attachment of the software and that increases the stickiness Exactly. Factor. And I think what we know from like our user research so far is that people- mostly see differences in how they're treated at work. So the most common like quotes and observations that people share when they use Bunch for a long time are like, I get more opportunities. I get projects that I didn't get before. I am respected differently. Like my boss asks me for advice in situations mm. that has never happened before. My team gives me better feedback. Overall, I feel like I'm calmer and I can deal with stressful situations more and so on. So None of this is like superbly surprising, but typically very difficult to combine. So I think it's, we are already driving those results in the users that are retained and active users. And now we need to help everyone else jump on that boat by making it even more than transparent. So they can see the transformation and then you can market to that exactly. transformation. Oh, I love that. Yeah. For our audience out there, where can people go to one? Thank you for being on today and also learn a little bit more about you and Bunch. Thank you so much for having me. And I think I'm super open for any connections and reach outs and DMs on LinkedIn. Just with my name, Daria Gutnick, you can find me there. And if you want to check out a bunch, I highly recommend it. We have a free version and there's a daily tip every day. And if you're mental espresso to go to the right mindset for work, um, you can download it on the iOS and um, Apple I store, uh, Apple store under bunch coach or bunch work. And yeah, let me know what you think. If you try it. We'll add it and I'll put the links to Bunch and to your LinkedIn on the show notes. Thank you again, Daria. Thanks so much. If you found value in today's podcast, please consider sharing this with someone that you believe could also benefit from this episode. You never know, you may be the catalyst that opens them up to a new way of operating their business and experiencing life. As always, it's an honor to be a small part of your journey. This is Raul Hernandez. Do good work.